So yeah, today I'm going to be talking about uh, the variational quantum eigensolver or VQE and how we can apply it to quantum chemistry. Um, so this was a, a lecture that I gave about two years ago uh, to the chemistry department. And uh, essentially what I did was I adapt, adapted this to a quantum computing audience, but it's pretty general. So I'm not going to go super deep into anything, but hopefully I guess at the end, uh, everybody will leave with a general sense of the algorithm and why it's so powerful uh, to quantum chemistry problems. That's kind of what I'm hoping everybody walks away with. Okay. So first I'm just going to go over generally what quantum chemistry is. In quantum, quantum chemistry, uh, the problem we're aiming to solve is a mini-body Schrodinger equation. This is uh, the time-independent form. So it's just a simple eigenvalue. Well, it's an eigenvalue problem. Uh, we act on the our wave function with the Hamiltonian, and we get the energy out, where this uh, sub-indexed E, E of zero is the ground state energy, E of one is the first excited state energy, and so on. And the point of this is so we can map the potential energy surface. Services. Uh, this gives us stuff like structure, spectra, properties, you know, dipoles, quadruples, stuff like that. And then uh, it allows us to model reaction pathways. <clears throat> so to start off, we have to represent our wave function. And we do this with something called a Slater determinant. Okay, so this here is not a matrix, but rather it's a determinant. So literally the thing that we learned about in our linear algebra classes, right? Um, Slater determinants uh, enforce anti-symmetry with respect to electron exchange, so that's why we use them as our wave function. These chi's here are what we refer to as spin orbitals, so they have a spatial factor and some spin factor that is uh, goes along with them. And then these uh, x's here are just the coordinates of the electrons. We can simplify this notation a bit by, um, I guess, kind of turning into Dirac, Dirac notation. So now our chi's are just our spin orbitals. And we can go one step further and say that if we have an occupied spin orbital, occupied with an electron, we give it uh, a one, right? And so this is what's called an occupation number vector. Uh, and these occupation number vectors are part of a vector space called the Fox space. Of course, not all orbitals are necessarily occupied. So we can index these vectors with either a zero, meaning it's unoccupied, or a one, meaning it's unoccupied. And so you get stuff that looks like this, essentially like a bit string. And so hopefully, you know, quantum computing people, this starts ringing some bells in our heads. Uh, these occupation number vectors that span this subspace of the Fox space, there's two to the n of these. So that's the dimensionality of these vectors within this vector space. Okay, so that's our wave function. And now um, I'll move on just briefly to second quantization. So we have just an idea of the operators that we use in this formalism. So we have the creation operator. We act on our wave function. Um, creation operator index P acts on spin orbital P. Okay, this is what we call the phase. And just like briefly, you can see that we sum up the occupation numbers before the spin orbital that we act on and then raise negative one to that number. So odd number gives you a negative phase and so on. Um, and so essentially we populate our spin orbital and change the occupation number to a one. Uh, oh yeah, that's the phase factor right there. Now, if our spin orbital is already populated, then our vector goes to zero. And this is just the Pauli exclusion principle right there. Uh, we also have annihilation operators. This is the exact opposite. So we also have this phase that we pick up and it depopulates our spin orbital. Uh, and again, if we try to uh, operate on a depopulated orbital with annihilation operator, it goes to zero. So these operators satisfy anti-commutation relations. An anti-commutator is just the opposite of a commutator, I guess. So it's AB plus BA. Um, and so the anti-commutation relations are this to annihilation operators, anti-commute, as the same with um, creation operators. And then the anti-commutator of an anti uh, annihilation and accretion operator is the Kronecker delta function. So this means that if the indexes are equal, it equals one, otherwise it's zero. All right, so we also second quantize our Hamiltonian. In chemistry, we uh, apply something called the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. This means essentially our nuclei are just so massive compared to the electron, we consider them a static. Uh, they just don't move at all. So we kind of toss the nuclear um, contributions to the Hamiltonian out 
And so we just have the electronic Hamiltonian. And uh, I index it here, but I probably won't always index it. Uh, this right here is the kinetic energy. This is the Coulomb interaction term. And then this is our uh, electron electron repulsion term. The second quantized Hamiltonian looks like this. So we kind of just like, there's this operators that we have here. This is the one body interaction term. This is the two body interaction term, as we call it. And then these H's are integrals. So again, we have our kinetic energy, our Coulomb term, and then our electron repulsive integral. So, yeah. Sure. No, I think once you use have the operators, it's these are second quantized operators. And then I guess I get you could say the occupation number vectors are the second quantization. Yeah, yeah that or the yeah. well the park hole picture is the operation. So I'm being very specific with my notation and saying occupation number vectors. I mean a lot of the times more informally, we'd probably just say Slater determinants, right? But um, I'm being very specific because I presented this to Piotr Pietsu. Um, so I, I wanted... Huh? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I see. Uh, okay. Ver the Fermi vacuum versus true vacuum. Yeah. I think it's still second quantization with the true vacuum. Yeah, I think it's... Yeah. Sorry, that's a deeper into the subject that we will ignore, um, but yeah. Um, so anyways, these integrals are classically tractable. So this is not the hard part of our problem. What is the hard part of the problem is solving for the actual wave function. Um, and not just like the Slater determinants, but our mini body wave function that accounts for correlation. And so what we do is we run to something called couple cluster theory. This is kind of the um, workhorse theory of ab initio calculations. Um, so just briefly, I'm not going to go over, but there is something called configuration interaction. Uh, and if you do full configuration interaction, uh, it's actually the exact wave function within the basis set that you're using. So couple cluster is a, um, approximation to the wave function. It's not the, unless you add all, well, it doesn't matter. Um, so it is an approximation, but it's size consistent, uh, which truncated CI is not. So anyways, that's why we like to use it. If you use all of the, if you do full couple cluster, I guess, but if I'm going to truncate it, okay, well, the truncated version is an approximation, um, but we're, this is not an electronic structure theory seminar. This is a BQE seminar. Okay. So the uh, wave function is this, we call it the exponential on SOTS. So we have this cluster operator T, um, the exponential raised to the cluster operator. And then our reference state is, um, usually we determine it from some mean field theory like hartree fock or you know whatever you need to use for your specific problem. So the T operator is a sum of subterm T operators. Uh, for example, we have T1, this is a single excitation operator. And so single excitations are like this. Let's say I have, this is my reference uh, wave function. Okay, these are two particles in this particular orbital. And so with the single excitations, I kind of just account for all the different single excitations out of my wave function. So we have a bunch of different uh, combinations. We use combinatorics essentially. Um, T2, uh, we call this doubles. So it's kind of the same thing, but you know now we just do two, time, two at a time. If we just include singles and doubles, it's called CCSD. Um, so this is what a lot of people use a lot of the times. You can also go further, triples or whatever. And then like was said before, let's say I have three electrons in my system and I add all my triples, then it is the equivalent to the full CI wave function. Um, so anyways, CCSD scales on the order of M to the six, where M is the number of Slater determinants in your basis. And um, so it's still a big problem. It's not like this is a small problem. FCI scales factorially, so it just like immediately blows up. CCSD is still pretty big though. Um, anyways, uh, we so in general, we're limited to small molecules. If you wanna do something bigger, like you know metal complexes or proteins, you run to different methods. Um, to solve for the energy, we you know just take the expectation value with the Hamiltonian. This right here is called the similarity transformed Hamiltonian. 
And we can use something called the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff um, formula to solve for this Hamiltonian. And essentially it's just like the Hamiltonian uh, with you know, nested commutators of the cluster operator. So the BCH or yeah, BCH formula um, for regular couple cluster truncates at the fourth order. And so we're able to solve this classically. And uh, the problem is, or one of the things it, that the problem is, is that uh, couple cluster is non-variational. So we can't use it for variational quantum eigen solver. Of course. So, if we want a variational theory, could yeah. Could you explain more what what you mean by non-variational? Um. Yeah. So, a couple of others is what's called a projective method, and so I think it's because this is non-hermitian. You can't. Um. It's not like this wave function is not the same as this wave function, and so you can't apply the variational theorem, essentially. And I'll go over a little bit what the variational theorem is, but um. The reason we want a variational wave function is because as you can kind of keep minimizing it and you know that as long as you, let's say I tweak my wave function a little bit and I get a lower energy, then I know that I'm getting closer and closer to the ground state energy. Yeah. But, um, so very, I guess I, I had assumed T was anti-permutation. So you think it's conjugate and with minus, is, is that not true? In this per, in, in couple cluster, this is not the um, complex con. This isn't the um, adjoint of our uh, cluster operator. It's just the negative. So that's why this isn't variational. Yeah. Uh, this is like, uh, uh, no, it's not unitary either. So this is. Huh. I'm sorry. I still couldn't hear you. Um, yeah, it's a Jack, Zach, shut up. Uh, sorry, but I couldn't hear because of him. Yeah, what again? I don't know the answer to that question, to be entirely honest. So I'm kind of nervous to answer because I might give you wrong information. Um, but um, yeah. Yeah, does any, any electronic structure theorists know the answer to that question? What was the question? I can't hear you. I thought P for P was unitary, like normal operators in class. Yeah, the C with the T could be, but the similarity can't come from Hamiltonian, right? E minus T at E T, that would be unitary. Yeah. So actually, if you built a matrix, right, it wouldn't be symmetric. Um, so if you diagonalize it, you would get left hand, right hand, time value. Um, He's gonna fix that, yeah, yeah, I'm going to fix it. No, but he's gonna fix that. so that's also why we call it a projective method because this isn't the um, these aren't the eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian. So you kind of like project out, and then when you diagonalize it, you get the eigenvectors essentially. Um, yeah, anyways, I will fix that um, by using unitary couple cluster. So it's a similar exponential on SOTS. Um, so now we're subtracting the adjoint from our cluster operator, the adjoint of the cluster operator. And then we solve kind of in the same way. Um, but yeah, this time this is unitary, right? Because this is the adjoint. Um, and we can get our energy. So the benefits of this is that it's variational, which is brutal. It's kind of something we always want. Um, but the cons of it is that the BCH formula doesn't truncate. And so now if we're gonna use a classical computer, our computational resources grow exponentially because in principle, we have this infinite series, okay? So we don't actually use UCC um, for the most part. Uh, usually you just, you, you're either gonna use traditional couple cluster or you know other methods that are appropriate for the problem. So we don't really use unitary couple cluster even though you know it kind of seems like you'd want to. But conveniently, we can actually readily apply this on a quantum computer. Um, so let's relate the two, just kind of at face value real quick. This is our qubit wave function. 
This is our occupation number vectors. Um, we have the qubit wave function with dimensionality to the n, and then the same thing with our occupation number vectors, you know, considering that we're limiting it to the sum of the electrons, right, in the um, vector. Okay, so at face value, it seems like, okay, uh, mapping the wave function one-to-one -one kind of works, right? So what we need to do is actually construct the operators to build the wave function, you know, create these uh, cluster operators. And so what we do for that is called jordan Wigner mapping. So in a jordan Wigner mapping, there's a couple different ways to do the mappings. And I think we're going to learn about one in the future. Uh, but I just think this is like the easiest way to understand, especially for, you know, kind of a general lecture. And so what we do is we just kind of store the occupation number directly. The occupation number is either the ground state of the qubit equaling unoccupied or the excited state of the qubit equaling occupied. Right. So what we want to do is we want to have some kind of qubit operators that act like this. When we act on the zero state, it raises it to a one state. So some kind of raising operator. But then it needs to kill the vector when uh, it's in the one state. So we can't just use the poly x gate. Right. Um, and then the same thing with the one state. We need some kind of lowering operator that lowers it, lowers it to the ground state, but kills it off when it's in the ground state. Uh, conveniently, we can do this with poly gates. It's perfect because we need to do that with quantum computers, right? And so these, uh, this raising operator looks like this, poly X plus I Y. Um, so yeah, I, I use this notation um, for that. And then the lowering operator is poly X minus I Y. The problem is, is that these operators don't satisfy our anti-commutation relations. So we don't pick up those phases when we actually use them. We can just like operate directly onto our qubit. And so these are what's called local operators because we can directly operate on our qubit. And so, um, but kind of conveniently, again, it does anti-commute with the poly Z gate. And so what these operators end up looking like, uh, let's say we're modeling our creation operator, we have the raising operator, and then we have these strings of Z gates. And then the same thing with the lowering operator. And so, like I was saying, these uh, these Q operators are local, meaning that I operate directly on my cube or qubit. And then these uh, the parity or the phase of my um, wave function is stored non-locally. So I use all the other qubits um, with the preceding indexes to store the phase of my wave function. And so that's why we call um, the parity non-locally being stored, and then the occupation being locally stored. And so then you can do something called parity mapping, which is like the exact opposite. And then there's something called Brabi katave mapping, which is just like totally super hard to describe. Um, I do have slides at the end though that that go over that, but it's just like, it was too much. Um, okay, so uh, Z is the poly Z matrix. So essentially if it's in the one state, it adds a negative phase. And then if it's in the zero state, it doesn't do anything. Oh. Yeah. Um, remember that these are all spins. Yeah. That's the that's the spin orbital p. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. I guess I'm wondering why q goes up way less. I I kind of switched to quantum computing notation. Yeah. 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 So, anyways, Gabe, did you have something that you were gonna say? Yeah. Exactly. This is this talk is actually kind of a teaser for two future talks. Okay, so again, I'm keeping it pretty general and hopefully just giving you kind of the basic ideas to help build upon uh, other people that will give you a more in depth. Um, anyway, so I'm pretty far behind. Um, so what do these two operators look like? Uh, let's take HU in the HF state. This would be the full CI wave function at spin equals zero. Um, so this is what the operators would look like. If I'm acting on my zero qubit, and again, I'm quantum computing notation, I just have my raising and lowering operators acting on this qubit. And then if I want to act on qubit one, I have to do a poly Z gate on my uh, one qubit. And then I act on my, uh, or sorry, zero qubit, one qubit. Anyways, yeah, I think you all get the point. So um as you see, we're kind of building up these strings of Z gates to uh, make these operators for each of the qubits. All right, so let's actually look at an action, fermionic operators. 
This is our uh, HF wave function. So if we want to build this FCI wave function, we have to do a bunch of combinations of these. So uh, I'm going to use a lowering operator onto my zero qubit. And it looks like that. And then I'll do an annihil or a creation operator onto my two qubit right there. And then we can kind of quickly do the math in our head. We have zero plus one, negative one to the one equals a negative one. So we picked up a negative phase, right? All right, so let's look at the jordan Wigner mapped qubits. Uh, this looks, they would look like this, right? Is what we're trying to do. So lowering operator onto the zero qubit. We don't have a phase that we pick up. And then again, we'll do this. Uh, Z acting on a ground state qubit, eigenvalue of one. Z acting on an excited state qubit, eigenvalue of negative one. And then finally, we have the raising operator, which turns that to a one. And so as you see, they act the same way. So that's really great, uh, right? So now we have our operators mapped. Um, and then I'll just mention that what we call, this is called the poly weight. So they have the order of the number of qubits, essentially. So poly weight's not good because that means, you know, you have to add more gates, right? So the higher the weight, kind of the worse, the more gates, um, the more decoherence mechanisms are introduced into our uh, computer, right? All right. So we have our um, second or fermionic operators mapped. So let's actually talk about the UCC operator. All right. So we approximate the UCC operator as some uni unitary operator uh, via, via trotterization, sorry. So we need some, this is our onsots, right? Um, and then I think it, it'll become apparent in, in a little bit why I'm using thetas instead of little t's, but these are the cluster amplitudes. And so I wanna trotterize this. This is the trotter formula right here. Um, essentially, since these terms, when you have uh, operators that don't necessarily commute in an exponential, uh, you can use this approximation and turn this into a product instead of a stump instead of a sum, right? Um, and so rho is the order of tr trotterization. You can do first, second, third order trotterization. You have different trotter errors. Um, kind of conveniently, there's a lot of convenient things that I keep saying. Uh, we can just use one trotter step for this. So I'll plug that into my single trotter step, and we get this uh, for our new um, for our approximation. And then remember that these T operators are just, it's a sum of these polygates. So this P I'm using to um, signify this tensor product of different polygates at you know, various ranks of our cluster operators. Okay, so I'm gonna plug that in. And then um, you can go read this paper, but essentially these subterms of these polygates do happen to commute. And so we can do one more approximation um, that looks like this. So we get double product of exponentials of polygates. Okay, quantum computing audience, let's take a maybe a second to look at this. Maybe we recognize this a little bit. So what about just one qubit? We're just gonna have one polygate and an exponential raised to some polygate with a phase. Maybe any somebody recognizes this gate. It's okay if you don't, I don't know if I would either. Exactly. Oh, beautiful. Somebody did. Um, yeah, exactly. It's the rotation gate. So how nice is that? We kind of were able to immediately map these um, uh, this wave function cluster operators to a rotation gate. And now maybe that kind of makes sense why I'm using theta, right? Um, okay, two qubit rotation gates. Uh, this could be something like an RZZ gate. And so you essentially just do a C naught entangling the qubits, do a rotation, and then another C naught. Three qubit, three body, um, or three, yeah, three excitation, I guess. And so as you see, there's kind of a pattern. You essentially get these strings of C knots, and then you do a rotation, and then you get another string of C knots. Okay, so that's how you kind of, um, those are the rotation gates. So let's actually look at the circuit of one of our cluster operators. So this is T1 um, for UCC. Now I'm going to trotterize it real quick. So this is my first order of trotterization. And then remember, these operators look something like this, right? And so um, this is what our trotter, trotterization will look like. And so in, in the end, our circuits look something like this, okay? So again, we have these strings of, this is just, imagine uh, a string of C naughts linking qubit P and qubit Q. 
And then what we're doing here is you have to remember that these Q uh, raising and lowering operators have poly X and poly Y gates in them. They don't actually have, we're never actually doing a poly Z gate on P or Q. And so what I'm doing here is I'm, the Hadamard gate is a change of basis to the X basis. So I'm changing my basis um, on P and Q. And then this effectively is this X rotation, right? Then I change it out of the X basis. And then this isn't a Y gate. This is a change of Y basis, which I actually believe is an RX negative pi over two. And so again, I'm changing to my Y basis and doing my uh, poly Y gate on it. Okay. And, you know, um, I have some two papers cited if you want to kind of see the mechanics a little bit more of these circuits. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, yeah, I, I kind of knew that it was, I meant very much to just be like, this is a change of Y basis, but thank you for pointing that out. Um, okay, so awesome. We've mapped our operators, which allows us to map our um, wave function on SOT. So now we have to find the ground state. And for this, we use variational quantum eigensolver uses the variational method. So the variational principle states this, that um, the action of the Hamiltonian onto our wave function psi is minimized at the ground state energy, right? And so uh, I guess essentially the idea of a, um, a uh, variational principle is you just kind of take a guess at the wave function. Uh, let's not even think of it in second quantization, but let's just say I just kind of throw out a random wave function. And then I, you know, plug into this formula. And then if I tweak my wave function a little bit and I end up getting a lower energy, I know that the, my new wave function is closer to the true wave function and my energy is closer to the true ground state energy. And so if I'm able to minimize it as much as possible, I'm getting closer and closer to the ground state energy. All right, <clears throat> so this is the principle we're exploiting. So here's the outline. We have some trial state that we give adjustable parameters, right? We need to be able to have some kind of parameters that we can tweak um, in our wave function. We evolve the wave function and then we take the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. Um, we feed the measurement into our classical computer and then we optimize these new parameters. And then finally, we just kind of iterate this procedure. So we would evolve the wave function again and then um, you know, tweak the parameters with the optimizer and then just minimize this until we've reached some convergence threshold that makes us happy. Okay, so why VQE? Well, the current quantum devices that we're using are pretty noisy. We're in the NISC era, we all know this here. Um, so our coherence times are short. Essentially that means that we can't use a fully quantum mechanical um, uh, algorithm, something like the phase estimation algorithm, which I'll briefly talk about, but not really. Um, and uh, so we limit the overhead by breaking up the calculation. So we have a quantum part and a classical part of our algorithm. Um, because optimization routines are, for the most part, cl classically efficient. Um, so we optimize our parameters classically and exploit the variational principle by optimizing parameters that minimize the energy. And then finally, uh, evolving the wave function is quantum mechanically efficient. Right, so um, actually doing all the wave function evolution, building the wave function um, will be done with a quantum computer. Okay, so implementing it. We have this qubit operator, some unitary that we're approximating via tronorization. We act on our reference state gotten by some mean field calculation um, with some initial guess of parameters, um, hopefully motivated by, you know, um, science, I guess. Uh, anyways, evolve the wave function with our um, our unitary and then take the expectation value of our Hamiltonian to get this parameterized energy. Okay, then we optimize classically with new parameters and update it. So again, I have this, uh, I'm going to throw about, show you about five of these, but uh, classical mean field calculation, mapping, computing the Hamiltonian, toss this into the quantum computer. Here's me evolving my state to, um, you know, using my unitary. And then here's the Hamiltonian, take my measurement, calculate the energy, toss it into some classical optimizer, minimize my energy with new parameters, and then just, it's like a circle. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. 
So the trial wave function, again, it's just some parameter, parameterized trial wave function. We know that the Hamiltonian is minimized at our ground state energy. So we want to find some trial parameters that minimize this energy. We use the gates to evolve the wave function. You know, these are just some unitary gates. So again, it's just the same example. I kind of just repeated the last slide, but we have some parameters, take a measurement into the classical computer, update each parameter into a new one until we're happy. All right, so the Hamiltonian, just remind you of our second quantized Hamiltonian. We form the Hamiltonian, measure it. So remember our, from our jordan Wigner mapping that these are just products of polygates. So it's just a sum of a product of polygates. Um, yeah. And then we take the expectation value with our wave function, feed that into a classical computer, and then optimize our parameters. Uh, I know I'm saying it a lot, but just that's the whole point, right? <laughs> So former Hamiltonian like that, let's say one part of our Hamiltonian is just a ZZ operation. This is my wave function, something like that. So we'll just do the math in our head with the ZZ and um, operating on our wave function looks like this. Remember eigenvalue is negative one for excited state. So uh, ends up like that. And then we take the expectation value. These are probability amplitudes. So we get um, this. And since these are just probabilities, and then we multiply it by H's, where our H of J's are the integrals that we computed classically. And so that's kind of it. It's kind of like this perfect, like exactly what we use a quantum computer for, right? We get probabilities, and then we kind of weight them by these integrals. Um, and these are like the Slater determinants, I guess, or the um, you know components of our wave function. Okay, so moving on, then we have optimization. Uh, optimization is just such a huge subject that um, I started making a slide about optimization and then it was like, um, now nah, I'd have to make 15 of these. So I'm not actually going to go super deep into optimization. I have some experimental results at the end that will kind of go over uh, at least the ones that they use in the experiments. But just to give you a brief idea, we have some objective function, okay? And so O is our measure of um, expectation value. C is just something that maps the expectation value to our objective function. And then our ex expectation value is the measurement outcomes from our quantum computer. Um, we optimize, oh, the challenges with optimizing at this is of course, sampling and gate noise, um, precision of measured expectation values. That's always gonna be a problem. And then there's also something called the barren plateau problem, which is like, you can have a vanishing gradient in your um, phase space of your like energy phase space. And so it kind of makes the optimization really hard in specific areas because essentially you just like don't know where to go. And so you get stuck. I mean, this happens a lot in different, different um, things, right? But it's just one of the problems we have to deal with in BQE. Okay, so the strategies, again, I'm just gonna go over kind of the general overview of everything, gradient-based search methods, um, you know, first order derivatives, gradient descent, whatever one you like, um, second order derivatives. There's some gradient free search methods um, such as the Nelder mead algorithm. And then also there's like some analytical optimizations, which kind of, you know, your objective function may have some particular analytical properties to it. So you can exploit those um, anyways. So that's optimization. Uh, I think this was the main review that we had in the email. And so like, it's, a, it's, it's pretty long, but it goes over a lot of different optimization stuff. So, um, and there's even more than what I'm just mentioning, but you know, okay. So from there, I can talk about these experimental results, which I really love. This was, I, I like fanboy over this paper. I, I really love it actually. Um, so I think this was the paper that made me be like, oh, okay, I understand so much why we use quantum computers to do this problem. Okay, so in this paper from 2014, almost 10 years ago now, um, which is kind of crazy to think about, uh, they use a photonic qubit, okay? So you had photon pairs generated by spontaneous parametric down conversion. Um, essentially, I, th I think it takes one photon and then splits it into two of half the frequency. So you get two photons of equal frequency. I assume that's why they did this. Um, and then you have these wave guides that encode your ground state. They did hydrogen and helium plus. So the ground state just is zero, zero. And then they have these phase shifters, okay? And so 
um, I think it's this paper right here that shows that any unitary in SU2, and this is the group that we're concerned with, our um, quantum computing operators, can be realized with just three phase shifters and an MZ interferometer. So that's kind of crazy. So all these phase shifters together, they make up, um, I think somehow they were able to get an MZ interferometer out of the two of them. I was like a little confused about that. I don't know, I don't do a lot of optics stuff. But essentially, this experimental setup has an MZ interferometer, which does the C naught, and then um, the phase shifters, which act like the polygates, effectively. Um, so yeah, we have these voltage-driven uh, phase shifters, and these are kind of our variational parameters, right? And and then these um, these are the detectors that did single photon counting, and so I think based off the polarization of the photon, it chooses a detector to go in. And that's the state that you measure. And so um, that was one of the you know, challenges that they have with this. They toss it into their optimizer, you know, do the expectation value, um, and then update the parameters, which are just these phase shifters. All right. So the optimization, they use the Nelder mean algorithm, which I mentioned earlier. So it uses the simplexes. And this is this is working, right? Yeah. Okay. Beautiful. So the simplexes are like triangles and I think they can get more complicated. Um, but you know, and again, this is a Wikipedia thing that you, if you're really interested in how it works, but they essentially just kind of walk along the phase space to the minimas. Okay. The reason they did this is because it's more robust to Poissonian noise and miscounts for, um, than like a gradient based search method. And so since they're doing single photon counting, I guess it's just like, Every time I've read one of these papers, it always just seems like you choose your optimizer based off of what system you're using. Okay, so their system is this photonic device, so they chose an elder mead. Um, and then your parameters are just these voltage driven gates, right? So they alter the phase, and that's your parameter. All right, so these are the actual results. Um, uh, again, it was HEH. Plus. And so you kind of see this is the theoretical results, um, probably FCI. And then in the gray is the actual experimental results. And then they did some correction to it. Um, but kind of funny enough, I actually prefer almost to look at the gray because I think it follows the curve just enough. And then I kind of toss this in here and then take like a second to breathe and really like take it all in, okay? Because if you kind of look at everything, they were able to match this curve really well with literally two photons and then a bunch of phase shifters, right? Which I think is just like so like interesting because if you think about the whole point and the problem that we're trying to solve is we're trying to solve for a wave function. And what is the more obvious representation of a quantum mechanical wave function than a photon, right? It's literally a wave, right? And then we just shape it a little bit at a time with phase shifters. I kind of think of it like I'm doing a sculpture, right? Like clay. My initial wave function is just my initial block of clay. And I just sculpt it little by little until I have my final sculpture, right? And so you have a wave function to calculate a wave function. It makes so much sense to me. Of course, we want to use a photonic or a, a quantum computer to solve this problem, right? Um, and then, of course, we just break it up. And so, yeah, anyways. Uh, that's my rant about how much I like this experiment. Um, and yeah, so hopefully that kind of gives you an idea. Now I will move on to another VQ experiment. This was done by IBM. And so this actually is not UCC. Um, they have a different kind of wave function. It's called a uh, hardware efficient on slots. And essentially um, they have a wave function with something called a unitary entangler, which I can kind of go over, and then Euler rotations. And so they, it looks something like this. And essentially the idea is that uh, UCC circuits are pretty complicated. Like we saw them earlier, they get these strings of C knots. And so this is very much like they tailor their onsets to how their computers work, right? Because I don't know if you know the layouts of the IBM computers, but it's not like everything is fully connected. And so those strings of C knots would actually be pretty annoying on an IBM computer. 
uh, that you'd have to do a bunch of different combinations that it's it would be more than just that string actually. Okay, so you have this initial rotation. I'll actually show the circuit. You have this initial rotation, and then you have this unitary entangler. And so what this was is um, it's like a C knot. So it's this uh, two qubit cross resonance gate. And so if you know what that is, um, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong about which one's which, but you have a control qubit and you have a target qubit. And so what you do is you drive your target qubit at the frequency of your control qubit. And so it's essentially the same thing, the same thing as the C naught, it's this cross resonance gate, uh, but you just don't need as high a fidelity. So it's kind of like a low fidelity C naught gate. Um, it doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to entangle everything. Okay, so yeah, you have uh, rotation, entangler, rotation, and then this depth is just the number of layers of this thing that you do. You take, this is your uh, Hamiltonian, and then you take your measurement, and that's your circuit overall. Um, yeah, so your parameters depend on the number of qubits, n, and then how, how many, um, how, what your depth is, plus two, okay? Um, yeah. And anyways, um, so the optimization that they used was uh, simultaneous perturbation stochastic approximation. If you go into Qiskit and you want to do one of these experiments, this was just, I think it's just native in Qiskit. So this is probably what you use. Um, and again, this is just like, they're saying it's best for these transmon qubits. So that's why we use this. So you per perturb it in two directions. Looks like this. You know, you have your um, initial parameter and then you perturb it in two directions and you get this G function like this. So this is the expectation value with your two perturbed parameters. Um, this C is like predetermined from what I understand. It's chosen to make sure this gradient descent is as smooth as possible. Um, and then you get this where this A value is determined after I think the first optimization. So it's kind of, it has to deal with the differences of the expectation values for K equals one. Okay, and then this is your new parameter. And so as we see in this, um, this graph right here, you know, they're doing, you know, whatever, like, sorry, it's really small on my screen, 250, um, 250 over here, but it looks like, you know, it evens out right around here. And then as we see, we're um, changing these Euler angles. So just the angles of the X rotations, right? All right, so what do the actual results look like? Um, the black dots are the experimental results, and then this kind of like fuzziness is uh, simulations. Okay, so um, they use an SEO3G basis. It's a minimal basis, so two electrons, two qubits. Okay, same thing, four electrons, four qubits. Okay, so um, this one, they say, gets to chemical accuracy, or pretty close, I think. Um, and so that's cool that H2 works really well. Uh, not so much for lithium hydride and beryllium hydride. Um, oh, this was a wave function. They only used a depth of one, um, just for coherence times, you know, again, it's a give and take their system. This was a, a good depth for their coherence times. Okay. So initial rotation, entangler, another rotation. That's their wave function. Um, this weird bump right here, they kind of claim in the paper that it's insufficient circuit depth, but I was actually watching a um, lecture by Arthur Ismailov, and he was going over um, VQE and uh, actually pulled this same experiment up. And uh, essentially what he did, so he's an electronic structure guy, and um, his group investigated this a little bit and kind of interesting enough, this kink actually links up very closely to when there's a singlet to triplet state transition in the spin. So his idea was that there's actually symmetry being broken. And so it's not just because they didn't entangle it enough, but rather there's this is picking up a symmetry. And then they were able to fix this by constraining um, their onsets a little bit more. Uh, to account for that. Um, right here, it says optimizer stuck at a local minima, but, you know, maybe as a chemist, we know beryllium hydride also just happens to have an avoided crossing. 
for its first excited state, which means that the energy of the first excited state gets really close to the ground state, but doesn't cross. Um, and so I guess like, you know, I don't want to say anything definitive, but it kind of looks like we're almost picking up some excited state characteristics um, in this calculation, which I mean, in the end would kind of be getting stuck at a minimum, right? It'd be the excited state minimum. Um, so that's pretty cool. They looked at, you know, the number of entanglers versus um, the noise strength. And then, of course, if you want to entangle it a whole bunch, um, you know, it's kind of think of it as the equivalent of doing a bunch of uh, a bunch of if you, if you look back at UCC, think about it as doing it a bunch of, um, you know, cluster operators, right? Doing more and more excitations. At least that's how I think about it. Um, so, yeah, if you want to use eight entanglers, you can get below chemical accuracy if you have a very little noise. But, you know, the more entanglers, the more noise, you kind of mess it up a lot because, again, we're in NISC era. Um, yeah, okay. So uh, those are the results for the transmon qubits. Pretty cool, I think, still. Yo. They thought this was like an optimization thing. Did they try changing um, literally the base parameter on the last slide? Or was there like a step or something for the gradient? They tried changing that or was it? I don't exactly remember. I don't think I can answer that question, but they have like a super long supplemental that goes over. Like, like I think this is from the supplemental. So if you're like really interested, you could look at it. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. They kind of just say, this is what we think it is to my remember, if I remember. Um, I could add that. I yeah. Think people try to, I think it's a generally tricky issue. Like, I don't think there's a really uh, neat way around it completely. But I think people try to start with a large step size and just to make sure you explore everywhere. You don't have to whittle it down every time. Right? But I mean, whittle it down to your stuff and your stuff. Um, yeah. But, yeah. I think it's a generally tricky issue, though. Um, yeah. yeah. No, optimization. Yeah, read that Tilly review, optimization. It's a whole subject. You could do a whole presentation on optimization uh, for VQE. Um, okay, cool. So I did a personal experiment. Again, I made this presentation like two years ago. So this is old. It's actually even the old Kiskit package. I legitimately think you can't even use this package anymore. I think it's appreciated. Now you have to use the runtime stuff. Um, but you can still do... Um, VQE in Kiskit, but you have to use Kiskit runtime. But so I used uh, the Aqua package, um, UCC singles and doubles, SCO3G, um, just a minimal basis. And then I use parity mapping, which again, I have some slides, but it sounds like we're even going to go over that next week. So whatever. Um, and I, I, I don't know. It was just probably the, the, um, what do you call it? The example that I was using use parity mapping. Now, um, so this is the the um, quantum computer, and then I just use a classical computer. I just use my favorite chem uh, quantum chemistry program. I did what I considered a fair uh, comparison, which was the same basis, singles and doubles. And then I did an unfair comparison, which means I added perturbative triples uh, and used just like a totally massive basis for this problem. Um, and I mean, as you can see, yeah, okay, it's not great. Um, but it still kind of does it. And then you also have to remember that I use UCC on their hardware, not the hardware efficient on SOT. So there's some caveats to everything, of course. And then we're in the NISC era, yada, yada, yada. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd be kind of curious. I, I just haven't had time this term. I would be curious if it would be different on the newer computers, um, and, you know, or a research computer with a uh, Kiskit runtime, but, um, I don't know, maybe that's something somebody else could do and, uh, get better results anyways. So future prospects, uh, near term, we're kind of using VQE. There actually is, um, more techniques that are coming out, um, that I was, uh, my, my friend does electronic structure theory and, uh, he was saying that like the electronic structure theorists have gotten their hands on the problem and they're kind of going at it in the way that we do the problems um, nowadays or the classical problems. So there's something called like Qubit Projective, 
eigen solver, which I guess is good because like couple cluster is a projective method. Um, so anyways, VQE is good for noisy hardware and requires less coherence times. Um, but long-term we'd like to do something called phase estimation. And so um, I'm not going to go over what phase estimation is because it's just another thing. It's like, it deserves its own talk. Um, but essentially you entangle the wave function with a bunch of insula qubits, you evolve your wave function with these unitaries, and then you find the phase of the insula qubits. Um, I feel like though, like if you're actually like in the quantum computing field, you should understand this algorithm because it's super, super important. It's not just for quantum chemistry. Actually, Shor's algorithm is kind of like you use phase estimation in Shor's algorithm or something kind of like it. Um, but anyways, I guess the idea is that when you evolve this wave function, uh, the phase of these insula qubits kind of match the Hamiltonian of your um, wave function. And so this phase kind of, or, or sorry, it matches the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian. So this phase is telling you the eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian, which our Hamiltonian uh, is the ground state energy. Okay. And uh, the problem is, is it's a fully quantum algorithm, 100% quantum mechanical from start to finish. We don't have the coherence times at the moment. Anyway, so my key points, uh, our operators are being expressed as poly matrices. Um, our contributions to the wave function are being represented in this occupation number vector form. Okay, um, UCC is variational, so we can kind of use these trial parameters to approximate our UCC wave function and then optimize the parameters to minimize the energies. And then the challenges is just the coherence times and the noise plus the larger systems. Okay. So um, at that, I'd like to give my thank yous. Um, you know, first, I'd like to thank the organizers. I absolutely love this seminar. I think it's such a good environment. And, um, you know, when you give a talk from two years ago and you have to like re-update it, especially for a new audience, you realize like, wow, I had absolutely no idea what I was talking about two years ago. Um, and so it was really great because I learned so much doing the talk and, you know, I just I always have fun. Um, uh, of course, in, anybody who helped me, Piotr Pietzu's group always helps me with these presentations whenever it comes to electronic structure theory. And then, of course, I'll plug his class. If you're really interested in this subject or you want to get into VQE, uh, Chem 993 with Piotr, uh, it's a really great class and I really like it. So if you want to learn more about many body theory, of course, I'm being funded by the NSF. So shout out to um, my funding agency. Uh, Oh yeah, the, the lectures are on YouTube, so you could teach yourself, but uh Piotr's uh Piotr's a master. He's it's 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 like a really good performance. But yes, the, the lectures are on YouTube. He did um it at another school. Uh and they're really good, they're almost exactly the same. So, anyways, but I do like that class. And then uh who else do I want to thank? Kathy, of course, uh, my advisor, you know, for all the support and um yeah, the audience, of course. So at that, that's it. Um, yeah. So I guess if there are more questions, we can do it. We had lots of in the middle. So I um, was pretty, not terrible on time, actually. Five minutes to spare. We have, uh, yeah, thank you so much, David. Yeah. Time for a few questions. Um, there's about two minutes till the hour. So um, are there any questions for David? I'm curious what you do for Eric and Matthew. Um, I think it was just like, you know how with Kiskit they have the textbook? I think the textbook just used parity mapping. Yeah, it was just like, this was just like a little for fun, you know? Oh, I'm I'm adding it to my presentation, you know? So, yeah, but... It gave it sound like the real question is why does the Kiskit textbook use the parity? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it explains it. It was just so long yeah. ago. Yeah. Yeah, I and I do have slides on Bravikatev and it's just every time I even attempt to do this slide, it's just like so complicated. It's just like go read the paper or listen to a much better presenter and then parody mapping. But again, it's just like, yeah, it's not intuitive. So, so we're taking time. I do want to ask if there's one more yeah. question. We have one more question and then I'll say you know, people can stay out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but, uh, I'm curious, what is the, what, what is the, uh, the, 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 the,
I guess one of them. Yeah, that's a really good question. But yeah, I, de I definitely don't know the answer to that. That would be a really interesting thing, though. Um, yeah, but I mean, it's got to be shorter, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't use this. Um, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. That's a that's another interesting question. I don't know. Probably I don't know. You know, kind of in my head, I would almost think that the quantum part is kind of more time consuming because you can't just do it once. You know, you have to do it like a thousand times. These are probabilities, right? So, um, I guess just uh, yeah, in my head, I would think quantum. To be, to be fair, though, yeah, this is exactly the sort of thing you would do with Monte Carlo. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, like compared to uh, a regular couple cluster. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it would be faster than regular couple cluster for sure. I, I mean, say, I think I think the limit isn't even time right now. Just yeah. We literally can't do it. Because yeah. It's so like, you know, give me as much time. As yeah. Time as I do it, I so, time so a lot of a lot of my research is pretty small systems, and so I can do full CI on these systems, and just kind of like as a. Um, kind of anecdote, I guess. I was uh, messing around with helium hydrogen and um, I had like, you know, one basis set that had like maybe 130 orbitals in it. And the calculation for full CI took, uh, I don't know, 15 minutes. And then I went up to another basis that had like 190 orbitals in it and it took five hours, yeah. right? So it just immediately blows up. Um, and so that's kind of why. And again, like I said, it makes so much sense. Wave function, wave function, you know? Yeah. On, on that note, uh, yeah. with, with, with that sign off, let's uh, yeah. make it over. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs>